In October of 2022, I demonstrated what I believe to be the greatest period correct setup for the GIOS operating system on a Commodore computer as it could have been assembled in 1989. My system consisted of the following. A Commodore 128 DCR with an internal 1571 floppy drive, a 1902A Commodore monitor, 512 kilobyte RAM expansion unit, external 1581 drive, and a Commodore 1351 mouse. That GIOS setup I created is a massive chef's kiss of 1980s glory where Commodore 8-bit computing was at its peak. Frankly, the only thing missing was a laser printer. And let's be honest, if you're going down the GIOS rabbit hole, even back in the day, the whole point was to create a powerful Macintosh-like desktop publishing system that didn't cost gazillions of dollars and leveraged the computer you already had. Since then, I've continued spelunking into that fascinating and deep GIOS world that took hold in the United States with the hardest of the hardcore Commodore 8-bit fans. Today, I'm changing the date in our DeLorean to 1993 to show you my latest, Ultimate Geos Battle Station Part 2. At this point, Creative Microdesign's CMD really started to push their hardware innovations into the marketplace. They were known for Jiffy DOS, but starting in 1990, they began to produce hardware for the Commodore 64 and 128 that are now all considered holy grail items in anyone's collection. And this is because they are some of the greatest hardware ever produced for Commodore computers. The CMD production timeline is as follows. 1984, Jiffy DOS, kernel ROM replacements for computers and several disk drives. Eventually over 20 different ROMs were and still are produced. 1990, CMD HD hard drive series, 20 megabytes all the way up to eventually two gigs. Also in 1990, the RAM link. The PPI RAM drive was released earlier, which CMD acquired and expanded. 1991, Gateway. Gateway is a GIOS desktop replacement software package. 1993, the FD2000 floppy disk drive. And 1996, the Super CPU, at least V1. Today's new 1993 edition Battle Station is going to again include the monitor and mouse from before, as well as the C128DCR with the internal 1571. But we're making the following changes. We're swapping out the 512 kilobyte REU with a CMD RAM link packed with 16 megabytes of RAM. Obviously we're keeping the internal 1571 and we're swapping the Commodore 1581 with a CMD FD2000. Updating GIOS 128 2.0 with CMD's very own Gateway 2.5 software, and finally adding the Star NL10 printer. I might have added a Super CPU 128 from 1997 to this setup if I had one, but that's one of the only CMD pieces of hardware I've never been able to source. But honestly, it's fine without it. Some of you might be asking, what would it do? It would convert a 1 or 2 megahertz Commodore machine into a 20 megahertz machine, which is completely bananas. We shall begin our journey through our early 90s setup with the glorious RAM Link. Originally in 1990, the RAM Link was a RAM expansion product that was intended to either replace or be used with one of Commodore's REUs. Unlike the REU, however, the RAM Link is externally powered and designed from the ground up to act as a RAM disk and it could internally hold up to a staggering 16 megabytes of RAM. In addition, you can use it inside or outside of GEOS. For the heavy GEOS user, I see you over there in the corner. The RAM link gave users over 30 years ago the most possibilities with any RAM device ever. At the time, some considered it one of the most remarkable devices ever produced for Commodore computers. With a 17XX series REU plugged into the RAM link, you can take advantage of the DMA capabilities of the REU for GIOS. However, in 2023, it is simply way too easy to fill the internal RAM slots to the max, so you can build a separate partition to do the same thing. Of course, my RAM link has the 16 megabyte SIMs, but back in the day, 16 megabytes of RAM 
could have cost well over $1,200, which you can practically double in today's money. Most folks in 1990 would have installed one to four megabytes if they didn't simply slap an REU into the appropriate slot up top. The device is plugged into the cartridge slot on the back of the computer and has its own separate power supply to keep the data you store in it safe after you turn off the computer. There's also an optional battery backup. Since I never move my machine, I use a modern UPS to protect my data in case I ever lose power, just like a lot of us did back in the 90s. The Ramlink can also be fitted with a real-time clock chip, which you can use to automatically set your GIOS clock on boot up. The data I moved to the Ramlink is accessible so quickly, even with a one or two megahertz computer, it is really hard to express how amazing and modern a Commodore computer feels when using a RAM link. It might even make your Windows 11 machine feel, well, sluggish. And while I've said it a few times already, it's totally worth repeating. This device hit the scene in 1990. While the C64 market in the US was in a steady decline by this point, there was a very strong diehard contingency that clung to CMD's miraculous advancements in the face of impossible headwinds. The RAM link also comes with CMD's Jiffy DOS built in, which can be enabled or disabled with the flip of a switch. In order to take full advantage of what Jiffy DOS provides, it needs to be installed in both the computer and any drive you want to use with it. As an example benchmark, a Jiffy DOS enhanced computer and 1541 can demonstrate 13 times faster disk operations. Jiffy DOS also adds tons of powerful and convenient shorthand commands allowing power users to quickly perform common tasks on their Commodore computers with just a few keystrokes. No more typing out long basic statements for what should be the simplest of tasks, like formatting a disk or scratching a file. And the statements are identical whether you are in C64 mode or C128 mode. As an added bonus, the RAM link takes over the Commodore's kernel, thus removing the need to add Jiffy DOS to our computer at all. You want Jiffy DOS? Just pop the RAM link in like a massive cartridge and you'll never have to crack open your computer's case and swap out the kernel. When Jiffy DOS is in use, most of your beloved physical disk collection will suddenly seem like it is high on speed. It's awesome. Additionally, all CMD drives, the RAM link, the HD hard drive, and their three and a half inch floppy drives, they all work the exact same way out of the box. Once you learn how to use one, it'll be second nature when you get the next one. And you know you'll want the next one. They all allow you to install multiple types of partitions on each device, including a native CMD format, which lets you use a disk's entire capacity, all of it. This is a really big deal for GIOS users who typically are constrained to disks conforming to the disk sizes found on the 1541, 71, and 81. Another one of the awesome superpowers of all CMD storage solutions is we can format partitions on them to emulate other Commodore drives. In other words, I can create multiple partitions to emulate the 1541, 71, or 81 disks or CMD's native format. In the case of my RAM link, that means I could have a CMD native 16 megabyte single disk, which frankly is insane. Or I could organize it into 31 individual partitions and mix and match partition formats however I want. And on the HD, as many as 254 partitions could be created. Of course, the same is true on the other CMD hardware options where the HD and its space potential makes the mind boggle. This means we get virtually 100% compatibility with CBM drives, which GIOS can recognize, mount, and use but we can also upgrade our GIOS experience to see the entirety of the CMD native partitions, which breaks open enormous storage potential in a world where files are laughably minuscule. And of course, the same is true for simply storing gobs of files in C64 or 128 modes. Some of you old graybeard BBS sysops out there are probably wiping away a bit of moisture from your eyes at this stage. Since the RAM link is powered, whatever you move over there will be waiting for you even after you shut your machine down and back up again. But at least with GIOS 
you're still constrained to the storage limits of disk emulation. Access will be virtually instant, but limited to physical floppy disk storage sizes. Also, GIOS can only see three drives, A, B, and C, and realistically only two drives can be used at a time. With these known limitations and with Berkeley Softworks starting to move its attention towards the IBM PC, in 1991, CMD released its own GIOS desktop replacement program called Gateway. You needed GIOS 2.0 to already be installed, but could then install the Gateway on top of it. Gateway provided several fantastic enhancements to GIOS users. It updated the user interface, including Amiga-esque enhancements like a drive's fuel gauge and windows with <gasps> scroll bars. Ability to access three drives simultaneously from the desktop. It offered MS-DOS-style subdirectories. You could drag and drop for copying files right on the desktop. And native modes, the ability for CMD hardware to not be confined to emulated Commodore drives, but be in full CMD native mode and vastly increase storage potential. CMD direct access partition support, which allows you to set aside a specified portion of RAM for use by programs that require an REU style RAM buffer area this can speed up GIOS even more. And most importantly, Gateway provides several device drivers that see and utilize CMD hardware to the fullest, creating what feels like a next-gen user experience. And remember guys, we're still in the early 90s here. Some might be tempted to think of CMD's floppy drive as what might have been a Commodore 1591 had Commodore ever made one. The CMD FD2000 comes in four basic parts. An IBM style Teak three and a half inch disk drive, serial cable, of course, utility disk, and a small nine volt wall wart, not some giant brick power supply. The front panel contains one switch and three LEDs, power, activity, and error. The FD2000 packs a lot of features into a pretty small package. It can format, read and write, 800K 1581 disks. It can also format, read and write 1.6 megabyte high density disks. It can emulate the standard Commodore DOS, work with GIOS and CPM, logically split disks into multiple 1541, 71, and or 81 partitions, logically organize partitions into subdirectories. It can include an optional real-time clock chip, which allows date stamping of files, and I have this upgrade. It can support Commodore 128 burst commands and it comes with Jiffy DOS built in, of course. And without any special drivers, GIOS will actually see the FD2000 as a 1581 drive. GIOS can also take advantage of 1.6 megabyte disks by formatting one disk into two 1581 partitions, which is really cool. But when using Gateway, we can use native 1.6 megabyte HD disks in their entirety. And a Jiffy Dust 1.6 megabyte floppy disk on a Commodore 128 in GIOS almost feels like a hard drive in its own right. Of course, a SCSI to SD, CMD, HD, or RAM link are obviously silent, much faster, and can hold obscenely more data. But realistically, two to three HD floppy disks with an FD2000 can cover most of your GIOS gateway needs on its own, even without a RAM link. Like I said before, if you're gonna go through all of this, at the end of the day, there really should be some sort of print solution at the end of the chain. In 2022, while on the Particles BBS, I asked folks there what their favorite dot matrix GIOS printers were back in the day. One of the users, Paradroid, mentioned that he created what he considered his own ultimate GIOS setup before jumping to the Amiga. He'd performed a lot of research and determined that one of the best printers available at the time was the Star NL-10, which you could only purchase via mail order. As a result, they are extremely rare. Over the course of a year, I only ever found one, but I was able to obtain it. It comes with its own Commodore cartridge, which allows one to not need a special printer interface, which usually also require using the tape connector for power. You can simply plug it in directly into the serial port chain. There's also a GIOS driver that was written back in the day and is ready to go. While I needed to teach myself how to re-ink printer ribbons in order to see what the heck I was printing, I have to say I'm quite pleased with the results, whether I print in draft, high quality, or NLQ modes.
sucker is enormous and loud, but <laughs> I dig it. Wrapping your head around setting up Gateway can take a bit of time and concentration, but it's totally worth it once you take the leap. Similarly, setting up the RAM link isn't exactly intuitive at first either, but once you learn the process, it's pretty quick and painless, and making it the boot disk is worth any pain you might endure while learning the ropes. The data integrity on the RAM link, at least in my case, can be a bit shaky at times. I've seen data corruption in the main partition occur simply by removing the RAM link from the cartridge slot, even when there's no power to the computer. For this reason, I'll eventually make my HD200 my permanent boot drive in the future. But the truth is, the FD2000 can pretty much steal the show with a Geos setup like this, and it can pretty much do everything you ever need it to do. I like the flexibility of having a 1571 and FD2000 from a disk drive perspective. Most software is gonna be found in the 41 or 71 format, and it's easily transferable to three and a half inch disks on the FD2000. My current process is to boot off the RAM link and launch programs from it, but I save all of my new documents to a disk in the FD2000 for peace of mind. And if I ever find a super CPU, of course I'll probably give wheels a spin, but at the end of the day, all of this hardware exploration is ultimately about creating well-crafted documents and printing. I'm not going to be running a BBS with this stuff anytime soon, let's be honest. So at that level, if I never upgrade beyond Gateway, I'm actually totally fine with how things are right now. Plus, I have a really strong tendency to fall in love with blue operating systems. You know what I mean? So remember, guys, keep that Commodore love flowing, and we'll see you next time. Yeah.